Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 321 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day, is Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, and it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, looking very sharp and orange today. I thank like you. it very, very, very much. A big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Peppermaster, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we do anything else, let's ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Um, you know, I, I think it's good. I think it's good, honestly. I... I don't feel like I'm awake yet, and uh, I, I woke up at five on the dot, and I'm like, nope, too early. Went back to sleep for an hour. The alarm went off at six, and I'm like, I just closed my eyes. So I I think I'm good. <laughs> you know what? I'm in great spirits, and I'm feeling happy, so I think the mental health is probably good. I'm just not fully awake. Oops, my mic muted. There we go. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're feeling okay. Me too. Good morning to the best damn fam in all of podcasting. Good morning, Kit Donna, Kit Elaine, Kit Cassie, Kit Mike H, Kit Toronto Dan, Kit Mr. Cal. Lovely to see you today. Who else have we got? Kit Vim. Hello, dear. Bonjour, Kit PM Godin. Ça va bien. Good morning, Carl. Carl. Kit Carl, I should say. That almost makes me feel it. When I say, I say Kit Carl, I, and then I think Kit Kat. Um, and they go, mm, yeah, a bit of a difference. Um, <laughs> Kit Julian, good morning to you. Kit PNC Bio and Kit, who else have we got? I think that's everyone this morning so far. Unless somebody's popped in to say hello. Yes, Kit Ina or Ina. I'm going to guess not, Ina. Ina, I would think. I would I'm going to guess Ina. You can tell us if we're right or wrong. Please let us know. We like to get yes, things please. correct. And Kit Jillian. There we go. Ah, bonjour, mes amis, en effet. All right. Um, Mr. Grizzly, would you have something to start us off with today? I, I did, and I, I, I seem to have lost it. <laughs> I don't know where I went. I had something here, and I just went. Oh, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. Is this it? Hang on. Nope, here it is. Yes, there it is. It took me a second. I don't know what happened to my link. It, uh, I think I scrolled down by, by accident, and as a result, it, it just threw everything off. So I want to show you this. This is, um, it, I'm sure you, if you folks saw what I wrote up in, you know, the little blurb at the beginning to describe what's going on in the world. And, and <laughs> well... It's kind of like this. Bruce Arthur 
isn't directly saying that Pierre Polyev is in the pocket of Vladimir Putin, but all signs point to yes. And when you consider his IDU boss, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, is, you know, getting friendly with Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Viktor Orban, Modi, and we know what their geopolitical views are all like. And you know they're all aligned with Putin and Russia and what's going on. It makes you really start to question reality. Is the, le loyal, is the leader of the loyal opposition in the pocket of a Russian dictator? I mean, I'm not saying that he is, but the signs really do point to it. And it's like, you know, where was his outrage at Putin over Navalny's murder? His wording was very, very limp at best. Mm -hmm. it, it all points to questions that need to be asked by more media people because i mean we've seen him in the house of commons this is his applause for what we thought was a hero turned out to be a former nazi but we didn't know that at the time we all thought he was a hero who fought against well i guess was it the soviet union at the time in world war ii or was it just russia when was the F soviet union yes. formed it was the Soviet Union at the time? I have to That's a good question. Yeah, I don't recall. I have to check the history. It's been too long. But you've got people, uh, Jonathan K, John K, at John K, who is editor and podcaster at Quillette, which is a suspect uh, publication, to say the least, going on saying the dumbest Canadian newspaper column of 2024 was just retweeted by Justin Trudeau's Minister of Ratios. And I, I, it's the quote I pulled and put in our write-up at the beginning. Nobody is saying Pierre Polyev is uh, in Putin's pocket. Nobody is saying he or Canada's conservatives are as aligned with Putin as Donald Trump. But Canada's conservative movement is sliding in that direction and it's not hidden. So is, is JK pushing the medium that, hey, don't mind that our leader of the loyal opposition might be a member or, or in the pocket of a Russian dictator? Because it certainly seems to be that. I mean, we're, we're really in strange territory here, folks. When we have to pose the question, is our, is our loyal opposition's leader a Russian puppet? It's really a questionable thing. And I got to wonder, is that where we are now? Okay. Keep going. <laughs> well, it's all signs point to it. We've, it. It's the question that needs to be asked because you, you see his, his response when it comes to supporting Ukraine. It's getting weaker and limper over time. And when they say, when other leaders of other parties say, Canadians will stand behind you, the conservative leader always says, conservatives will stand behind you. Like they see themselves as apart from Canada. So I'm really beginning to wonder if he is in the pocket of a Russian dictator. I mean, David Wallace could probably give us a better idea on that because... We do know that back-channeled Russian uh, oligarchs are connected to the Ford government. They just handed over a, what was it, a $400 million contract to a Russian oligarch here in Ontario to dig a subway tunnel. You okay there? Oh, you guys got the sneezes? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> well, and, and Toronto Dan's got a good statement here. Here's the scenario. Harper's can clan plays nice with Putin till he passes and then we'll control Canada and Russia. Just saying. I know I will never vote for him. It's there's just so many suspect things right now when it comes to Russian money, Russian oligarchs, and the way that the Conservative Party of Canada, which we all know is actually the Reform Party of Canada, just under a different name, seems to be aligned with a dictator. Now, call me crazy. Go ahead. I, I don't care. I've been called worse by better. But 
it certainly seems to be that that is the direction that government is moving in. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, James points out, and uh, Bruce Arthur also pointed out in his editorial that we read in yesterday, it's uh, whether or not he's directly mm -hmm. a puppet or whether or not he's just um, appealing you know, using those bud, those buzzwords and those code, code words and not coming out too strong against certain things because he knows that it works with his base because there seems to be this mass movement in North America to get people to think that, hey, maybe Putin's the good guy here. Yeah, which is Particularly bizarre. with the conservative uh, base. And, you know, we've seen that a lot in the United States, particularly the GOP seems to be on running it, running that play, uh, at least the... Uh, the Trump faction of the GOP seems to be running that play because Mitch McConnell's not having any of it. Uh, but in Canada, yes, you're, there, there's some very interesting votes. Um, but that's that's one of those things. That, it's almost a chicken and an egg thing, right? Is, mm -hmm. is he in Putin's pocket or does he just not want to upset his stands who seem to be looking towards Putin and thinking, gee, maybe he's got something going on there? Because you have to understand that... Um, there's a faction of the conservative base, um, and we saw it with Stephen Harper, um, like strong, decisive government. Mm -hmm. But, you know, strongly and decisively leading you into a brick wall, <laughs> right? They don't stop to, just like the people, that, there's a section of people that want, I just want change, and they don't care change to what, they just want change. There's... There's a group of people that want strong, decisive leadership, and they don't really care in what direction, so long as it looks strong and decisive. Um, and Stephen Harper would promise that a lot, and uh, you know, projecting all these this talk about projecting strength and, and you know, making decisions. Uh, except as you mentioned yesterday, the difference between Harper and Pierre Polyev is that Pierre Harper seemed to believe in incre incrementalism, and that's what he's still doing today. Oh, yes. I mean, let's be honest here. Because we voted Harper out, but Harper never left the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. No. He just moved on to the IDU. He became the leader of the global conservative movement. So he's trying to do what to the entire world. What it is, his plan was for Canada. So when he stood up and said, "If you know, you won't recognize Canada by the time I'm done with it, well, Canadians sort of shut him down before he could finish, so he just went to the global. <laughs> he just went to the global and be the coordinator of the central brain from which all these conservative parties seem to download these same thoughts and same plays. Well, they all call themselves free thinkers, but they're all saying the exact same thing. So how free can they think and be? Exactly. So they download the thoughts, the plays from the central brain, and he's the one that's up there. He's sort of like the Wizard of Oz, and he seems to be having more success there because you can't get voted out by the people at IDU. Yeah, they cannot unelect you by voting you out. Yeah. So all of a sudden, right, he's hanging around. If you'll put this one up, Mr. Grizzly. We're seeing photos of uh, Stephen Harper hanging around with some friends. Yeah. He just seems to be showing up everywhere. So here he is with uh, Georgia Maloney, who I have to say has been surprising because mm -hmm. everybody expected her to go, be, go way more fast just than she has. And of course, she too went on the gay stuff. Um, well, yeah. In Italy. Because like, yeah, there was a common play, right? If you listen to if you listen to Putin, there are no gay people in Russia. No, none. And, and apparently none in Iran either. Yes. So. Wow, ah, come on, work with me here. With Maloney. And there he is with uh, Mr. Bonesaw. Mm -hmm. And there he is with Orban, as you just showed. And uh, lately. Oh, yeah, Javier Millier. Uh, no, no, he's not posing with Javier Millier, no, no, but, no, no, uh, but with somebody from his him. cabinet. Yeah. So he went and paid his little visit over there. So, um, and all then there's all signs point to uh, bad. <laughs> well, all signs point to bad, and like right now, there's another international court of justice thing going on. It's a different case because the one that South Africa brought itself has been resolved, and the court had ruled, you know, that Israel must, you know, do its best to try and save civilian lives. And now there's another thing going on where. About 50 different countries will be making some type of submission 
Canada, I believe, was originally planning to make an oral submission and has switched to just putting out a, um, a, a written one at this point. But we also have this from a place called The Breach. And uh, this was from December 6th. But it seems that Stephen Harper's firm has poured $350 million into developing military tech for Israel. Yeah, I read that article yesterday. We didn't have time to get to it, but it was like, hmm. He's also helped uh, and contributed money to developing spyware with um, some rather nefarious individuals. So uh, they're watching us, clearly. Clearly. And when I say, you know, they're, they're tied into the Conservative Party, the Russians are tied into the Conservative Party in ways we don't even understand. Let's look at this little thing right here. This is from Infrastructure Ontario. February 16th, 2024, Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinx have awarded a fixed price contract of $255 million to Strabag Inc. to design, build, and finance the second underground segment of the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. Let's scroll up here. On the same day that Putin kills his political opponent, Alexander uh, Nalvani, Doug Ford awards another massive construction contract to Strabag, partially owned by Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Oleg Deripaska, by the way, has been sanctioned. And he's also crying out that Russia might run out of money soon, so they won't be able to fight their war anymore. I just... It's all so suspect. It all ties back to Putin. All of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Deripaska is one of these oligarchs and billionaires who enriched himself... uh, during the fire sale when all the state crowned, uh, state-owned mm-hmm. assets went public, which is something that's done here a lot. Yeah. Have you noticed that, folks? Conservative governments have been uh, getting, creating fire sales and selling off crown assets for decades. And, 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 and oh. James just got it right here. The Russians are using conservative politicians worldwide to help divide the citizens of Western nations. They have willing partners because conservatives use polarization as a political tool. Exactly. So that's what the question is, is that whether or not, is it a question of does Putin have specific compromise on Polyev and is getting him to dance? Or is it that, hey, Harper and Putin made a deal and Harper promised that he would deliver certain governments to him? Well, I mean, you do and, realize well, that. Well, I mean, Har- Har- of all the people that Harper can have control of all over the entire world, it's going to be the person in Canada if it happens to be a conservative. Yeah. I mean, Polyev would be nowhere if it wasn't for Harper. You have to nowhere. remember that Polyev got his seat in Parliament because Harper led an effort to fraud, to defraud the Canadian public in that mm-hmm. election in 2015 with the in and out overspending thing. But this party in the second election in which it competed in as a conservative party of Canada as the rebranded, let's take away all the history from the progressive conservative party that doesn't belong to it. There was a hostile corporate takeover and mm-hmm. they acquired the goodwill from the former party. That's all they, and yes, they ran right. on that. But in their very first election that they won, they cheated. This party has corruption and cheating in its DNA. Just Period. like the UCP did in Alberta. The first, you know, Jason Kenney cheated to win the leadership race and then, you know, Rand Kamikaze cancel. I mean, so this party, this movement has corruption in its DNA. That's why they're always pointing out, pointing to everyone, saying everybody else is corrupt. Because they are so corrupt, it's it's. Absurd. What's to deflect from themselves? Of course, What's to it de- is. deflect from themselves, right? So talk about everybody else's corruption, so nobody's talking about yours. But if you, um, I mean, you sent me, you sent you sent me a somebody's tweet that had this. Mm. And when we're talking about conservatives doing it, I mean, let's take a little look at Harper's history here for the past years. That's, that's the segue I was going for, was that that one right there, sir. Yep. Harper inherited a $13 billion surplus from PM Martin, took $36 billion out of the budget, and uh, still left Prime Minister Justin Trudeau a deficit of $160 billion. Yep. Sold every Canadian asset he could. He sold Nexen to China. Mm-hmm. He sold Inco to Brazil. He sold Stelco to the USA. He sold Nortel to Sweden. He sold Falcon Bridge to Switzerland. He sold the Canadian Wheat Board to Saudi Arabia. And he entered a 31-year FIPA with China. 
in terms of which we're still not. That's right, because he entered that deal in secret, and we still don't know the full aspect of those terms. If you vote for the party that calls themselves conservatives, they are not. They are dictatorial reformers. If you vote for that party, you are voting against your own best interests. You're voting against democracy. You are voting against Canada. And we need people to see this. Now, I know there are hundreds, probably thousands, and hopefully millions of progressive conservatives who have come to this realization that this is not the party that you voted for throughout your life. Lifelong conservative friends of mine have started voting NDP because they, they don't, they hate Trudeau and they cannot in any good conscience vote for this current party that calls themselves conservatives. And we need to get the message out to Canadians that these people do not have your interest in mind. They will use you as a cudgel, as you've seen, they've done it before in the recent past, and they'll do it again. And when they're finished with you, they will throw you under the bus and drive over you. Melissa Lantzman days are numbered because eventually, once they get to a certain uh, position where they no longer need the um, prominent Jewish lesbian as a as a dividing cudgel, as a wedge, they'll toss her aside. You know damn well they'll do it. Oh, yeah. They don't care about anything but power, money, how to get it, and how to keep it. That's it. They just want to control you. They do not want to govern. They don't. They just want to rule over you. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and look at... All you have to do is look at, at Polyev's voting record over the last 20 years. He's voted against everything that would benefit the average Canadian. He's voted against wage increases. He's voted against union expansion. He's voted against unions. He's voted against affordable housing. His voting record is available for all to see. Matter of fact, if I can get the time, which I'll have to create more hours in the day to do it, I'd be happy to create a spreadsheet of all of his voting over the last 20 years and how his voting has harmed the average Canadian, average Canadian and the less than average, the below average Canadian, the people we don't see, the non-middle class, the working class and the poor. He keeps telling you he's going to come up with a program to solve housing. Well, I read an article about that the other day that just despised, d disposed of the whole thing. It's complete and utter idiocy. The math doesn't math on this system he wants to implement. They don't care about yeah. you. Yeah. Yep. I mean, Pierre Polyev has never, ever, ever met a union he did not want to bust. Exactly. Or a piece of instant back-to-work legislation mm -hmm. that he was not willing to sign on to. Ever. 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 He's never met. He's never met a piece of pro-worker legislation. No, that he hasn't been prepared to vote against. And we're talking like broad or thin. We talk, if we talk about raising minimum wage, yes, he doesn't get to vote against, vote for or against that unless it's for federal workers mm -hmm. specifically. But he always comes out against it every single time. Always comes out against it. Anything that, you know, when they were voting in Family Day. Mm -hmm. As a holiday, voting against it. What if businesses lose one day of work and they have to pay people? Well, it'll destroy the economy. Yeah. You know, extra benefits. He votes against it. Extra, you know, an extra day off for you. He votes against it. Child care, dental care. He votes against care, it. Ten dollar a day daycare. Voted against all he of against it. it. He votes for EI freezes. Yes. Oh, and and by the way, he tries to convince us that EI and CPP are taxes. Yes, they are not. he voted to raise the retirement age. Yeah, well, they did, the 67, and thankfully they dropped it back down to 65 once Trudeau got in. Yeah, so I mean, he, he's not, he's not going to be there to support you, and he's already said during the pandemic that well, we weren't worth the money yeah. that was spent on this. He's been campaigning for 
almost two years. Well, yeah, no, two years. Remember, they had flags made when they occupied before. My before, yes, Aaron O'Toole was deposed. Yeah, because he also, you know, was he not only came to power in an election in which his party cheated. He personally has a lifetime compliance order with Elections Canada because he too personally cheated in a subsequent election. And then, during the convoy, they had flags out for Pierre Polyev, Prime Minister, while there was still a leader of his party. He overthrew the leader of his party. Effectively, yes. That's what he did. And then he brought donuts and Timmy's coffee Mm -hmm. to people who sought to overthrow the duly elected government. And remember what Candy Bergen said, let's make this the Prime Minister's problem. And their whole goal in that was to make sure he invoked the Emergencies Act, hoping he would roll tanks in. Yep, hoping he would overreact so we would get all those visuals. Look at what And like we mentioned in when our federal federal court decision Mm -hmm. uh, show on Friday uh, on Friday. Because now we're wondering whether or not there was coordination between the federal government and the provinces for certain provinces like Alberta and Ontario to make the decision to not do all they could do Mm -hmm. when it was time. Why did Bud Doug Ford keep on disappearing? Why did Jason Kenney not cancel auto insurance? Yeah. And license plates in Alberta. For illegal blockaders, which, by the way. While he was asking Canada to send military aid over, yeah. how did Alberta say that the problem had exceeded their capacity in a letter? And then three days later, just hours before the Emergencies Act was invoked, claim, oh, we fixed it, mm-hmm. and then go to court about two years later. Well, don't be about two years later. The decision came about two years later. About a year later, went to court and said, no, no, we didn't need that. And wondering whether or not the government should have had the right to do that, given that Alberta didn't need it. On the day, three days after Alberta, through Kenny, sent a letter mm-hmm. to the federal government saying, help us send military equipment. When the Prime Minister invoked the Emergencies Act, when he had that telephone conference with the premiers of all the provinces, on which all the premiers were present, according to federal court documents, Alberta said, no, no, we don't need one. Mm -hmm. But three days before, they They did. They desperately needed one three days prior. Then all of a sudden, they didn't. Just like that. Help me, help me, help me. No, we're good. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Yes. Yeah, exactly. Kid James votes against all of those things, all while sending us to die, wanting to send us to die in Iraq. And again, yes. And the other thing as well, right? Let's not forget pay equity. Mm-hmm. The party still doesn't officially support that. Yeah. We're in 2024. And anytime you talk about pay equity between men and women, they turn around and they say, oh, what about merit? <laughs> In a country where there are more women than men. Working. And women are more educated. Mm -hmm. Talking as if it's impossible in a country of 40 million, in which more than half the population of women, that there are enough women of merit. That they still need to ask the question, hey, 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 what about merit? Well, and they go on about how they, you know. Look, there's that, but let's take a, a closer examination of how $10 a day daycare has been a net benefit to the economy, especially in the province of Quebec, where they have noticed that they have had far more money put back into the economy than ever came out to support the $8 a day program that they had in Quebec. It's been proven. Economists were like, holy crap, this actually works because women have gone back to work. And I can't remember the statistic. Was it something like 90% of women went back into the workforce who couldn't afford to do it before? Mm -hmm. And guess what? When you have more people working, you generate more money. And when you generate more money, what happens to that money? Well, they spend it on things like food and clothing and entertainment and trips and luxury goods. Mm It's how the economy keeps rolling ahead. We got a note from uh, one of our kits, Kit Beamer, who said, uh, 
send me something so that the next time $10 a day care comes up on your show, feel free to share my story. My wife and I were expecting twins in March of 2022, but they had other plans and arrived in December of 2021. Being born so early meant they spent a lot of time in the hospital. One came home the second week of March, and the second came home April 1st. I live in Brantford, but our hospital is not equipped to provide the care they needed, so they were at the hospital in Hamilton for a while before one of them got moved to Kitchener. Needless to say, my wife and I spent a lot of time driving and a lot of money on gas. Being that they were born early, my wife had to go off work earlier than planned. Combine the reduced income with the costs, and by the time the boys were home, we were already starting to find ourselves in a bit of a hole. In October, when my wife finally went back to work, we sent our kids to daycare. Finding a licensed spot is hard with one, but even more difficult with two. We couldn't find one, so they went to an unlicensed daycare. $20 a day per child, five days a week, it worked out to $1,600 a month. The little hole we found ourselves in quickly grew. We were fortunate enough to finally find a spot right before Christmas with a licensed provider, and it now costs $800 a month. That means less anxiety about falling behind on bills. It means no more skipping meals. It means stressing less about how I'll pay my mortgage. It's been a lifesaver, honestly. I know having premature twins isn't a unique situation, but having to pay for children isn't. I don't know how people with multiple kids in daycare manage to do it without the $10 a day daycare, but I really hope there comes a day when no one has to go through it. There you go. That's one example. Thank you, Kid Beamer. One example. One. And I guarantee you there are hundreds of thousands of cases like that right across this country. And what do we have in conservative provinces right now? How's the child care? How's the $10 a day daycare going in Alberta? Well, Alberta's trying to screw it over, but in many provinces, they're already down to $10. Mm-hmm. That's, I think in more than half the, prov- more, more than half the provinces that struck a deal right. where they had five years to get to $10, they're already there. Yeah. And like I said, you look at what's going on because in Alberta. They've, they've seen what it does. In Alberta, they're trying to destroy it because they just can't believe anything that the federal government would do would benefit Albertans. And yet... <sighs> the Prime Minister is building a pipeline to Tidewater where the Conservatives could, and Alberta is the province that got the most support during the pandemic. By the way, I had somebody the other day try and convince me, and I laughed... I literally laughed out loud for five minutes before I responded to him that Alberta has contributed more to equalization than any other province. We prop up the whole country. Okay. That's factually nope. not true. Uh, that's not how it works. Also, yes. nobody, nobody contributes to equalization. No, nobody, nobody. It's all the taxes go into a pool and then, then that tax pool gets doled out e- equally as, as is needed by each province. Number one, number two, it's not, it's not even it. That's not even it. Equalization is okay. Let's put it this way. You owe me a hundred dollars, right? You rightfully owe me a hundred dollars. You give me my one hundred dollars. The hundred dollars is mine. That's right. I decide that I'm keeping seventy five for myself, and I'm going to take twenty five and give it to somebody who needs and spread it around to a couple of my friends. Mm -hmm. That's what equalization is. The provinces pay the taxes that are due. Period. No more, no less. No. Then the federal government gets the money, and the federal government says, well, gee, we can spend all of this as the government of Canada, but hey, as the government of Canada, we notice that certain provinces have a little more difficulty making sure that Canadians from coast to coast to coast have the same standard when it comes to education, when it comes to health, when it comes to all that good stuff. So instead of keeping 100% of that money, we're going to keep a certain percent, and we're going to take this pro- this pool of money, and what we're going to do is we're going to sprinkle it around to make sure that the Canadians living there, whether they live in New Brunswick or PEI or whether they live in British Columbia, have a similar standard of health care. Which is what the program Nobody pays into equalization specifically. It's just a line item on the federal budget. Period. It's money that the federal government decides that they're going to transfer back to the provinces rather than spend on federal stuff. And who was it who changed those? That's uh, it. Who changed the way that was designed? Well, who was it? It was Harper's government, and they changed that when oil hit one hundred and forty dollars a right. barrel. Because then they were saying, "Hey, it's not fair to us because we have to pay more." So we made it so that such they paid less. And then when oil went to under zero, yeah, like thirty <laughs> during during the during the pandemic, because there was no place to store it, because you couldn't cut the production on a dime, but nobody was buying it because everybody was staying home, and it was hard to ship it. All of a sudden. Because everything was understaffed, mm-hmm. this, there was a period of time where oil companies were paying people to store it. 
It was like at minus $23 a yeah. barrel or something. Yeah. So when it went down below 40 or 30 like this, then they turned around and said that the formula wasn't fair because... So when oil gets, goes high, it's not fair because a higher portion of the profits are going to Canada. Mm -hmm. And when oil is too low, then it's not fair because not enough of it is... <laughs> It's just there's no pleasing these people. But here's the best the part: keep moving. But it's there. But here's the thing: is that formula was set mm -hmm. with a conservative premier right. in Alberta, yes. and the most pro oil government we've had in Canadian history mm -hmm. in Ottawa. Yes, and they were still not happy. Yeah, there's just no not pleasing. There's just no pleasing some people. Period. But let, let's not forget that this individual that I was laughing at when when I you know the whole equalization thing. And he goes, "Well, Alberta just contributes more." And I'm like, "Okay, the math doesn't math." There are 4.8 million people in Alberta. There are 6 million people in Toronto. There are almost 16 million people in Ontario. Please tell me how a tax base of 4 million can outstrip 16. It simply cannot. And then add the 7 million in Quebec. Another 7 million, almost 8 million in Quebec. Yeah. So I'm sorry, your math doesn't math. It, and where people think that this is a thing, it's like, did, did we stop teaching basic math in school in Alberta? No, I, and I'm, I'm seriously asking that question, because how could you possibly think in any world, 5 million is greater than 23 million? But they're that much more, they're so much more productive. And we're all, the rest of us are just freeloaders. Oh, right. Yeah. They do all the work. Yes, yeah. You know, the 75 hours a week that I work is not nearly enough. I got to work harder. Is that what it is? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. But it's the mythology that that party, when you have a party, when you have a region that's had one party rule mm. for forever, this, and say for four years, mm -hmm. We had Rachel Notchley, where apparently everything that's bad about Alberta today yes, happened yeah. during those four years, and it's her fault. Yeah. Right? It's not like, it's not the 43 years of uninterrupted conservative government <laughs> that happened before. It's just the four years of Notley, and it's not the 10 years or however years since. But over the last 60 years or so, there's been 56 years of conservative government. Yes. And nothing that's wrong with Alberta was the fault of those 56 years of conservative government. No, 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 no. All the problems were created in four years. All of them. Every you have to one. understand here that Republicans would have loved the concept of Alberta. Oh, yeah. Because in Alberta, for decades, uninterrupted, all the Republican, American Republican theories, economic theories about oil and gas and how it was the... You just had to let it be, and you know, got to apply. That was the laboratory. It was the dream lab for mm -hmm. that. And it didn't work. And it never will. Oh. They didn't really manage to save any you money. You were wrong about Quebec. Nine million. This, they could. Nine million. There we go. So, yeah. What they did to the Heritage Fund, they just dropped yeah. it. They haven't contributed in almost, what, 30 years? Moment. For the longest time, a lot of their crisis, when the price of oil dropped, it's because the government decided to fund schools and hospitals from oil royalties mm -hmm. rather than the basic funds of the province. Provinces have to do two things, is provide health care and provide education. So full funding from that should come from the regular tax base before any type of bonuses from fluctuating things like oil royalties. It's the same problem that we're having in Ontario and in Quebec mainly, but throughout Canada with the cap on colleges and universities. The provinces stopped funding colleges and universities from the fundamental tax base and we're using foreign student money to fund it. And all of a sudden there's a cap and they go, oh my God, what are we going to do? Well, you've been funding it from a source that is volatile rather than a fund that is stable. Bonus money from royalties, bonus money from international fees. Should that be considered that bonus money? Look what else we get to do over and above our core mandate now that we have this extra money. Or look at how much more we can put into our core mandate because of this extra money. But you don't fund your core 
business. You don't fund you. You don't count on your Christmas mortgage to make your basic mortgage payment. Not your, yeah, your, your Christmas, did I say Christmas mortgage? I don't know what you said. <laughs> you, you, had your Chris, you don't, you, you don't decide to take your, to take a trip mm -hmm. somewhere South and say, gee, I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. Well, Hey, maybe my Christmas bonus will be good enough this year to make you it up. You can't do that. You fund your mortgage. Yeah. And then if you get a Christmas bonus, you fund your vacation. Yeah. But they've been doing it the other way around. Well, and, and look at here. This is an article from... And when that money dries up, then they don't have the money for the basics. Here, here's an article from the Narwhal from 2017. Norway's oil savings just hit $1 trillion. Alberta has $17 billion. What gives? That's from 2017. Well, here's what gives. They don't contribute to it anymore. Yep, and as Kid James says, look, if you decide to never have a provincial sales tax, you can't complain about low inflows. If Alberta had maintained just a 3% provincial sales tax all those years mm -hmm. and took that money and just put it in that sovereign fund because they didn't need it because everything else. But they said, hey, there's no such thing as a good tax. So I mean, these are governments that literally cut their ability to do their funding, their, their core job. When Stephen Harper came into office, as was mentioned, he inherited a $13.6 billion annual surplus. What's the first thing he did? He cut two points off off the GST. Total cost about $14 to $17 billion a year. Yeah. He just decided he was going to forego that money. That was money he could have put into stuff to building stuff mm -hmm. for us. We're still paying down more debt. Jean Chrétien had established the pattern of one-third goes to tax reductions, one-third goes to new program spending, and one-third goes to debt reduction. We could have kept on down, kept down that path, but but Stephen Harper, the alleged trained economist, knew better. Well, and and you know when, admittedly, when he first got elected, I thought, well, let's see what an economist can do. Oh shit! <laughs> oh damn! <laughs> All he cared about was a balance sheet, but it wasn't a balance sheet in the positive for the nation, because he ran a debt a fiscal program uh, a, a debt budget his first year and he was handed a, a surplus no not first year the, the first two years was it okay he still ran surpluses the first two years he still ran surpluses but here we i'll bring it up for you because also from mel felon and that uh, tweet you sent me mm -hmm. when he got to 2000 because he got elected in 2005 that's right? correct yeah so 2005 2006 october 2005 so, I mean, Martin had done most of the work that year. But 2005, 2006 was a surplus. 2006, 2007 was a surplus. 2007, 2008, we started the deficits yeah. right away. This was before the economic crisis hit. Correct. The economic crisis hit in September 2008. So he's already, he was already running a deficit going into the economic crisis. Then we went into the economic crisis, and that was the year that Jim Flaherty produced, said that the, the deficit was only going to be a few billion. And then he came back and said, oops, sorry. Well, and, and let's not actually what happened. Actually, let, let me be let, let me be more clear. What happened? We had a fixed election date law, and the fixed election was supposed to happen way later. And then around July, because they always get these numbers with three months to advance, they saw the numbers start to turn towards the negative. So they called a snap election for September, mm -hmm. early September, and it was in late September that the economic crisis actually hit. They saw it coming. That's why they called the election in July <laughs> or June, because yes, they saw the numbers start to turn. And since it takes three, a quarter has three months, they got themselves a majority government before. And that was the budget where they turned around and they said, well, you know, all we need to do is kneecap per vote, per subsidy funding for parties that Jean Chrétien put in place. If we cut that off and we cut a, cut a couple of taxes here and cut a little bit of spending here, we'll be okay. And the deficit will only be a couple of billion. And then he came back a couple of months later and says, oh, you know that deficit that I thought, I'm, I don't know the number off the, top, off the top of my head, let's say five. Mm -hmm. That's really going to be about 32, actually. And everybody went, holy crap. And then he came back a couple of months later and said, uh, you know what, actually it's going to be 55.6 billion. Oopsie. He missed his budget projection by a lot when he developed the when he 
but that fall economic statement. That was Flaherty. Then the following year was $33.4 billion, then $26.3 billion, and then $18.4 billion. So they had four years of these massive deficits. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a global economic crisis, but the global economic crisis was not as bad as the global pandemic. No, not even close. The global pandemic we just had made that economic crisis of 2008 look like a walk in the park. Yeah. Our government didn't miss budgetary predictions by that much. They knew it was going to be bad, and they told us it was going to be bad. And then he ran 5.2 billion more in 2013, 2014, then 3.7 in 2015, 2016. And then in the last election, just before it, when he also decided to sell all the GM stock we bought at a loss at fire sale prices, just to make enough money to say he balanced the budget. Yeah. That's another Canadian asset he just sold to whoever, just put it on the stock market. Step right up, step right up. Don't be try, don't be shy. Give us a buy. And said, hey, we balanced. Uh, I was about to go there with that too because. Yeah. <laughs> like this. So he added $160 billion in debt while cutting $36 billion to healthcare, cutting funding for Environment Canada, cutting infrastructure spending despite all the economic action plan signs. And you got some people coming out right now because the conservatives have rebranded re the carbon rebate. Mm -hmm. It used to be the Climate Action Incentive Program, and nobody knew what that was, and now it's called Canada's Carbon Rebate. And then they'll turn around and say, gee, do you think that Justin Trudeau sending people checks makes it seem that they're trying to buy your vote? And I'm thinking, oh, gee, where did I, where did I put my bottle of President's Choice Memories of Economic Action Plan signs? <laughs> yeah. They were all over the damn place. There was more money some some places people thought that wasn't the case, but people had the impression there was more money spent on the signs than the ads. No, it wasn't. You're right. It wasn't the case, <laughs> but it sure felt like it because every time I drove down the highway. It was everywhere and on TV, all those things, and during hockey, Canada's economic action plan with those arrows that went up. <laughs> How much did that cost us? That was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. That was the other thing that the conservatives are very good to doing is appropriating public funds mm -hmm. for partisan promotion. Yes. Well, yes, it was a government of Canada plan. The government of Canada is legally mandated and required to communicate to Canadians mm -hmm. with their own money about what it is that they're doing with their money. But the number of signs and the number of commercials, you know, and everything had a blue background on them and all that stuff rather than the basic white background, you know, because when the federal government usually announces anything, at the end of it, it's a white background with the Canada logo, yeah. not the liberal logo, mm -hmm. not conservative, blue, the, not liberal red. It's the red. government of Canada, not the, not the Trudeau government. Yes, regardless of the party. Yes. Well, yeah, they did that at the mm -hmm. end, but all their ads had the big blue background and everything on it, right? Yes. That was all partisan advertising. That should have come from the Conservative Party of Canada's budget. Well, and, and let's not the Canadian taxpayers' budget. And let's remember that the Conservative Party of Canada's budget is still very heavily subsidized by the Canadian taxpayers, to thanks to the political donation tax credit. Let's not forget that under the Harper government, they they and we refer to it as the Harper government because it was not referred to as the government of Canada at the time. It was the Harper government. And he in, and for the first three years, Canada's new government. Yes, Canada's new government, the Harper government. And every they, press release. And they also insisted that you call his wife the first lady. It's not a thing. Yeah, that didn't last very long. No, it didn't. Yes, they did insist on that for a while. Because Canadians were like, what? No, that's an American thing. We don't, we don't do that here. We don't, we don't yeah. do that here. It's... He, he wants to sell us off to the highest bidder. And he's tr still trying to do it. Yeah. His IDU, what is it, International Democratic Union? There's nothing yeah. democratic about it. No. Nothing. Welcome to Coffee Talk. I'm Linda Richmond. The International Democratic Union. It's not particularly democratic, and they're not quite unionized yeah. either. Discuss. Yeah. It just sounds good. Like how fast he made Modi disappear, eh? Sounds good. Oh, yeah. yeah. It sounds good on paper. International Democratic Union. Hey, you know, that sounds like something right. that would be good for us. Union's good. Democracy is good. W wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is a group of dictators who want to take over the world and make us serfs in their feudal kingdom. We're not citizens. We're production units and consumer units. Human capital. How many times have you heard that in the last, I don't know, 10 years? Human capital.
They don't even see us as people. We're cogs in their machine. These are not good people. They do not have your interest in mind. All they want to do is rule. Pretty much. And, um, yeah, before we go, let's, uh, something interesting happened yesterday. Oh, uh, you know, the, the pleb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He put out a tweet. Um, this is not his tweet, but it's the image that he had in the tweet of, uh, Pierre Poliev. Oh. And, uh, I think that you will find this rather interesting here. Oh, the one, that one. Now, um, does this look like Pierre Polyev to you? No. So from uh, people who are listening at home and can't see, it's the picture of Pierre Polyev when he first came up and everybody thought that he was wearing the girdle with the muscle pack mm -hmm. underneath it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's sort of like, you know, he's shaking someone's hand. And then uh, somebody says, he's even doctoring photos now, he being pleb, mm -hmm. going to profess his love. Notice the squared off jaw, the manly four o'clock shadow, the bigger muscles, the fact that he's darker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just like thinking like with every doctoring, he's looking more like a G.I. Joe action figure mm -hmm. than an actual person. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. So, so, and that's the, the hyper masculine thing again that they're doing. So what Aaron O'Toole was doing it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that photo of him jogging where we saw the beefed up thigh and whatnot. But if you want to actually see it, better because i just showed you the first photo let's look at a side by side here oh my well the original on the right uh -huh. and how pierre looks in plebs wet dreams yeah that's the, the guy on the left's pretty good looking fella the guy on the right is the one we know darker five o'clock shadow more pronounced jawline chiseled jaw and then look at, the, the, look at the eyebrows, though. Yeah, fuller eyebrows. The eye make well. Look at his eyes and the eyebrows, and they thinned him out a little bit. Because if you look at the five o'clock shadow, the four o'clock shadow, whiter teeth. Yeah, fuller teeth. It's like wow, dude. Um. <laughs> and then this is the best one because it flashes back and forth. <laughs> Whoever did this one, yeah. Yeah. And uh, listen, here's the thing. Somebody asked a question the other day on the internet about someone that they're dating. Mm -hmm. And, or someone that had asked for a date and they found out that they had misrepresented themselves in a certain way. And they said, you know, is this a problem? Should I be, should this be a warning sign? Mm, okay. So here's the thing. Let's say you're on a dating site, mm -hmm. right? And somebody is describing themselves and they say they're 49. All right. And then you go out on a date and you start talking and you know, they're talking about, you know, didn't go into school and, you're sitting there and you're doing the math in your head. Well, wait a minute. It's like, if you're 49, did you start university when you were 16? Because <laughs> were you just like some type of genius? Because I'm working backwards and the math isn't mathing. It says, oh no, sorry, I'm 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 actually 54. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, sure. All right. If you're lying about the little things, the things that don't matter really, it happens to the rest. Yeah. What's what you gonna do when it really counts? This These people need the doctor images <clears throat> yeah. of PP to make him seem more masculine than he actually is. It's really disturbing. This plebe guy's really, really got a thing for him. Like the obsession is bizarre. 
and I, I sent him a message once and he didn't like it and I think he blocked me. But I said, look, I get it, man. You're gay. It's fine. Just come out of the closet. We understand you love the man. That's fine. But stop, stop lying to yourself. Just, just find the handle to the closet door, swing it wide open and be welcomed into the community. He did not take kindly to that. I'm like, well, please explain to me why, if you're not, would you do something like that? Because it's, I don't understand that type of behavior. Why are you so obsessed with the leader of the opposition that you would make him look like the kind of man you would like to date? Or the kind of man you'd like to be. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. If you need to lie, torque, distort reality just to have an opening basis on which to come in. Yeah. Everything that follows has no worth and it's just a waste of time. Completely. Utterly. Totally. Absolutely. A waste of time. Yeah. Waste of time. Eyes wide open, kids. Little lies. People who lie easily about the little stuff that doesn't matter. Like where you went to work. Mm -hmm. Or whether or not you're a dual citizen. <laughs> for example. Will lie about the big stuff. Guaranteed. Well, nobody asked me if I had dual citizenship. Why would we? Mm hmm. We didn't think we had to. Kits and Cubs, we hope that you enjoyed this edition of the Daily Beaver Morning Show because we love making it for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And you have the mouth that we want the word coming from. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you would like to be sure that you do not miss a show, you do not have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because she sponsored our pod page. If you scan that QR code that's beneath my chin, or if you're listening at home and go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, that will bring you to our pod page site. And if you subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, then you need to make like Kit Elaine. Ah, right on cue, my dear. Right on cue. Who says, have a beyond awesome day, everyone, and remember to smash the button before you leave. Yes, smash that button. Go to True North Eager Beaver Media on YouTube. Like, share, subscribe, smash one, smash two, smash three. Let your freak flags fly, man. We won't judge. We won't judge. No, we won't. No. Lick all our buttons. And if you want to support us in other ways, that squiggly by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you to the True North Eager Beaver coffee page and our emergency hydration fund where you can make sure that we have free beer today. Yes, kits and cubs, free beer today because trust me, this show does not get done with a whole lot, without a whole lot of booze. Doom scrolling takes a lot out of you. <laughs> it really does. It really does. I drink to cope. Uh, <laughs> or to forget. I can't really be sure anymore. <laughs> anyway. I might, I might, if I might you go there. start just going to the gym every day again. Just because I just need it. I need the outlet, man. Because alcohol isn't cutting it for me anymore. I need, a, I need to get to the gym. That's it. I think when we get the studio, I'm going to need to put like a speed bag or a punching bag. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> In it. That we'll get a dartboard with somebody's face on it and just. <laughs> so you go to our coffee page, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And uh, that will bring you to our coffee page. You can make a donation there. We really, really do appreciate it. Really do very much. Uh, let's see, because democracy is something that you do, write those letters. That's very important. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Well, yeah, I kind of have it scrolling across the bottom of the, the Chiron here. The famous quote from Mark yes. Twain, never argue with an idiot. They will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. And that basically boils down to what we've been talking about today. And, and, and it's a roundabout way I'm going to get there, but give me a second, bear with me. We are inundated with idiocy on, on Wellington Street here, just in front of Parliament Hill every single day, literally at the end of my street, because it's Wellington and Metcalf, and I live on Metcalf Street. That's no secret. Where there is a parade of individuals every day who scream, 
how much they want to have relations with the Prime Minister of Canada because his office is literally right next door. They do this every day, and and they're not getting the press they want anymore, which is why they just had another rally on the Hill, which was a complete joke, as we all know. Now, I have been sent some ad additional uh, footage, by the way, of uh, Dina Sheriff and, and what took place. Uh, she was roughed up pretty harsh, harshly. Yes, okay. she's an agitator, but she did not deserve what happened to her. I firmly okay. believe that. We'll see if we can have a look at that later in the week. But what I'm trying to get to in a very convoluted and unroundabout way is that we need to be ever vigilant every single day. These people are trying to harm our democracy and they are doing everything they can to do it. And the problem is they are loud, they are ignorant, they are ill-informed, and their message is getting through to so many people. And that's the part that frightens me. We have idiots preaching to the ill-informed and the ill-informed are believing them because they keep hearing the same information over and over and over and over. And it's a brainwashing. So please pay attention, share this program with as many people as you can. We want to bring you the facts. We want to tell you the truth. We want you to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I can't wait to see the video because I haven't seen it yet. We have kept James going that Tadina girl was being awful, but the yellow jacket guy should not have body slammed her. I don't know if the yellow jacket guy was an official or no, not. No, he wasn't. He was a protester. Oh. Yeah. He was one of the freedom yeah. protester people. It's pretty brutal. She was okay. belligerent. You know, as just James said, she was being awful, but he should not have done what he did. She did not deserve what happened to her. Belligerent, agitation, yes. Did not deserve that. Okay. Can't wait to see what it's about then. All right. Mr. Griss from the Beaver Lodge says, your eager beaver saying could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. Ah, we have Kit Donna asking, Greg, is this new? Yes, it is new. Our good friend, Cranky Canuck, Canada's favorite snowman, uh, designed a title theme for us after he uh, appeared on our show. And uh, so we're testing it out. We're wondering what you think about it. He's a, great, he's a really good fella. He's a really good fella. I just wanted to show you this thing, and then I got to head out. I got to get the office. But check this out. This is interesting. So this is Canada's current population, and you know how I'm fascinated with this. We're we're going to hit 41 million soon, which means we've grown by a million people in a year. But let's scroll down here and look at the numbers. What have we got here? Okay, Alberta, 4,825,696 people. That's, that's you know, it's a good sized city which is less than Toronto. Ontario, 15,944,109 people, and Quebec, 9 million. So basically that's, what, 25 million people in a population of 41 between two provinces? And somehow people in Alberta are still brainwashed into thinking they contribute more to the Canadian economy. I'm sorry, I know there are a lot of wealthy people and a large... Um, upper middle class population in Alberta, but 24 million to 4 million, I guess almost five. It just doesn't work, folks. It just doesn't work. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Indeed. Uh, okay. I'm seeing uh, some message from Kits here. Um, you're getting a lot of Douglas, DMs. I love your shirt. Like. Just saw the details on it. So fresh and fly. Thank you so much. And somebody asked me yesterday uh, before we left, and I only saw it afterwards, how curling went. Uh, our doubles team did 
qualify mm-hmm. for the final round. So for the first time, overnight success. After 20 years of curling, I finally have a chance for a club championship. We still have to beat teams one, two, and three, though. So it's a tough road to hoe. But hey, we're going to go for it. So there you go. Thanks for, for sharing in our joy. All right, Mr. Grizzly. I think we're done. We are indeed. I got to get to the office. I will uh, see you. Bye, everyone. Mwah.